afternoon, everybody. I think we'll, I think we'll make a start. Um, so thank you very much uh, all for coming to this first linguistic seminar of 2018. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome today uh, Dr. Luca Danna of the University of Mississippi. Uh, so Luca um, comes uh, from uh, Sicily and he did his undergraduate and postgraduate uh, education in uh, the University of Naples, L'Orientale, which is, uh, has a similar kind of remit to SOAS. Um, and uh, he got his PhD in Arabic dialectology in 2014. Uh, and since 2015, he's been assistant professor of Arabic at uh, the University of Mississippi. And Luke is a um, dialectologist and historical linguist. Um, and he's worked mainly on uh, Tunisian and Libyan Arabic dialects and covered topics such as uh, politeness, modality, uh, language and identity, and also does uh, very interesting work on uh, Arabic in the diaspora. And we're going to be hearing about some of that work today. So, Luca, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm grateful to Chris for inviting me. And in case you're wondering, my accent is the most unlikely combination of a native Italian accent plus a deep southern accent, because I've been living for the last three years in Mississippi, so I know it's not the... I apologize in advance. So, and today I would like to share with you uh, some of my research concerning the uh, Arabic in the uh, Italian diaspora, which is an understudied topic, and in particular about the community, transnational community of Mazzara del Vallo, uh, which is a small uh, fishing town in uh, Sicily, in southern Italy. I will give you the details. So, as you can see, uh, Mazzara del Vallo is the closest town, the closest Italian town uh, to uh, Tunisia. It's just uh, 100 miles. Uh, from Tunisia, and uh, the Tunisian community of Mazara is the oldest uh, Tunisian community and Arab community in, in Italy. It's been there uh, since the end of the 60s, and uh, it's been there. It's the history of this community as a sort of uh, an incident in the history of um, uh, the Arab diaspora in Italy and in Western Europe, because in the wake of the decolonization process, uh, the, the um, Arab immigration toward Western Europe uh, was uh, mainly addressed toward uh, great towns with, uh, which offered um, job opportunities to the, to the immigrants. And Mazzara del Ballo is a very small town uh, it's, uh, in, in southern uh, Italy, which is itself at the center of a process of, of immigration. So uh, it's, it's been hit very hardly by, by a financial and economical crisis. So it's very strange that it became, it, it came to host the, one of the biggest and oldest Tunisian communities in Italy. And that happened because at the, because at the end of the 60s with the Italian uh, economic boom, basically the younger generations at a certain point refused to, to, to take their father's uh, places in the, in the more traditional jobs such as fishing and in the pursuit for higher education and better paid government jobs. Uh, government jobs. So what happened was that there were vacancies in the fishing sector that were filled with immigrant labor. Uh, an Italian community had been living in uh, Tunis in the neighborhood of La Goulette for uh, uh, decades be, until the end of the French uh, administration. So there is this sort of, we don't know if it's history or legend in Mazzara, that the first Tunisians were called by the last Italians who left uh, Tunisia to go back uh, to Italy. And uh, most of the immigrants were uh, fishermen and uh, today this community uh, represents to me a very interesting case study because it, it, it shows uh, trends that differ substantially from what we see usually in other diaspora communities in, the, in Western Europe and in the US. Uh, so I will, this is Mazzara del Vallo. Uh, so it's a very, uh, pretty town and this spot here is the uh, place in which the Arabs came ashore in 827 uh, when they uh, started the uh, Arab Islamic conquest of Sicily. So uh, it's, it's 
peculiar, but Masada del Vallo was the first town conquered by the Arabs in the, in the Middle Age when they conquered Sicily. And the historical center of Masada del Vallo still bears the marks of this uh, Arab heritage. If you wander uh, through the streets, it, 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 it is very reminiscent of, uh, of a North African uh, Medina. So when the immigrants arrived in 1968, uh, there was the year of a tremendous earthquake that shook the, the, this, the, this part of Sicily. So most of the houses in the historical center and the historical center were not uh, were uh, damaged by the earthquake. The Italians were starting to leave, so they found a way to uh, gain something out of their houses by renting them to the immigrants, which created a sort of a ghetto in the in the historical center, uh, which was avoided by the Italians for at least 30 years. So the Italians left the historical center of their town, and they and they left it to the Tunisians, who created a close-knit community in, the, in, in what uh, was dubbed later by the Italians the Casbah, because it, it was so reminiscent of a, of a North African Medina that they disowned this neighborhood. And the, the existence of a close-knit community and one neighborhood that uh, was, I will let you see the, the, the neighborhood later, that was very reminiscent of a North African neighborhood, created some language trends and processes that are worth investigating. And to my surprise, when I started this research in, uh, in 2016, there was basically nothing that had been written on the community of Masara del Vallo. So during uh, summer 2016, and then during the uh, subsequent, uh, subsequent uh, winter break, I conducted uh, social linguistic interviews in Masara del Vallo, with a Zoom H4N, uh, using both a questionnaire and non-structured conversation. The interviews were then transcribed and coded um, uh, as far as the, the, the analysis of the variance was, um, uh, was concerned. And I used both a qualitative and quantitative approach uh, in analyzing the data. The range of phenomena that, uh, that, that resulted from this uh, uh, research is so wide it is impossible to cover in a single lecture. So, Dissemination of results included uh, a book that was uh, just published and uh, some papers. Uh, the book is in Italian, the papers are all in English, and they are all in different stages of completion. Some of them have been accepted and are in press, some of them uh, have just been submitted, some of them are in progress. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk with you about the, I will try to trace a, a briefly a social linguistic profile of the community. Then I will spend some time talking of um, interdialect uh, development and contact between the different varieties of Arabic spoken in Masara del Vallo, the different varieties of Tunisian Arabic and what happens to them. And then I will, uh, I will go to language contact between Arabic, Italian, and, and Sicilian with, of course, code switching. And if I manage to keep it within the 45 minutes, uh, some uh, uh, issues of identity that I find uh, particularly interesting. So. I will first give you some background on, of what usually happens to uh, um, Arabic communities in the diaspora. So we have the so-called law of the three generations, according to which the first generation uh, start experiencing uh, language erosion. The second generation uh, experiences uh, sometimes partial, sometimes total loss of active competence in the heritage language. And in the third generation, we have the total loss of the active competence and uh, severe loss of uh, passive competence in the heritage language. So we have different uh, descriptions. Uh, we have Buman and uh, De Ruiter, uh, and they, they uh, write about Moroccan communities in, the, in Western Europe and in, in the Netherlands. And Daher uh, writes about um, Lebanese community in the US. So there is a, an almost total shift to English or to the social, uh, socially dominant language uh, starting from the second generation. And usually third generation speakers are not able to communicate in the heritage language and their knowledge is, is uh, reduced to a set of uh, idiomatic expressions and um, of vague cultural identity. Uh, if we go to Masara del Vallo, the main trends are that not only is uh, Arabic uh, active competence in Arabic, uh, in Arabic preserved by second generation speakers, but the uh, large majority of my second generation speakers were dominant in Arabic. So their first language, even when they grow up and they, they complete their education in Italy, it's still Arabic. And uh, active competence is preserved at least until the third generation. The third generation is just coming of age now, so I didn't have enough speakers to, to, uh, to, to like, 
uh, describe the third generation in detail, but the interviews that I uh, conducted with third generation speakers were conducted in Arabic, and I was speaking to them in my Libyan variety of Arabic, and they were able to understand and to speak back in their Tunisian variety of Arabic. So there was some, also some metalinguistic competence uh, in, those, in those speakers. And of course, the first question and th th was partially answered by uh, my um, introduction was w is why uh, this happens in Mazara del Valle, why there is this very different trend. So I resorted to the uh, ethnolinguistic uh, vital vitality uh, framework uh, in its 1977 uh, um, version and, and the 2015 uh, enhanced version with the uh, um, psychological uh, vitality that was uh, described by Ehala, and basically uh, there are three factors that uh, shape the ethnolinguistic vitality of, uh, of a community. The first one is status, so the social prestige of the community. The second is institutional support, and the third one is uh, uh, demography. As far as the status is concerned, as you may imagine, we're speaking of a community of fishermen that were just brought to, to Italy to fill, um, to fill vacancies in the fishing sector. And they were, and, and who were um, not uh, considered as welcome in Italy because the labor unions uh, were afraid that they would destroy the job market by uh, accepting any kind of low wage that they would be offered, which sometimes happens. So the status is quite low. The institutional support, uh, both formal and informal, is mediocre. It's mediocre to good. I mean, there is in Italy there is no hostile. Uh, um, uh, policy against uh, the use of Arabic or there is nothing that the government is not doing anything to try uh, to, to uh, integrate linguistically the, the minorities. They are left to themselves with some interesting uh, phenomena that, uh, that, that arise from time to time. For example, in 1981, uh, in the wake of what we call the, the scarce literature uh, concerning Mazra del Vallo calls the illusion of return, so 12 years after the immigrants arrived, uh, they asked and obtained from the Tunisian government the opening of an exclusively Tunisian school in Mazara del Ballo. So at the heart of the uh, neighborhood, uh, of the, the, the Tunisian neighborhood, if, if we may call it the Tunisian neighborhood, uh, a Tunisian school was opened, which was not a Sunday school or an ethnic school, was an official branch of a school in uh, Tunis in which uh, uh, an exclusively monolingual uh, curriculum in Arabic was taught and in which, Arabic, in which Italian was not even taught as a second language. So the second language was French, Italian was at no place in the, in the curriculum, so the, the immigrants uh, managed to overcome one of the main uh, difficulties, difficulties of, of uh, diaspora communities, getting, education, getting formal education in the heritage language at the expense of the socially dominant language so that we may find people in their 30s uh, uh, born and raised in Mazzara del Vallo who's Italian and still clearly uh, as, as a very uh, heavy accent and is not grammatically correct. It's clearly a second, uh, an L2 Italian. Uh, not only because they lacked formal education in Italian but also because this school uh, was located and is still located at the center of the Arab speaking neighborhood so that uh, the young speakers didn't have to leave the neighborhood and they spent their entire childhood in a neighborhood in which the percentage of Tunisians ranged from 30% uh, in the outer areas to 70% in the inner areas. So that the, the dominant position of Italian within the neighborhood is, is, dub is dubious to say, to say the least. And if you take into consideration this, this picture. So we have not only the school, but also Tunisian coffee shops. We have a mosque. The, the Italian government gave them permission to perform the Adan so that in Mazara it's, it's customary to, to, to hear the Adan. So, and if you're in Mazara, even your uh, radio will not, uh, will, if you turn on the radio, you will listen to Tunisian music because it's so close that you, you feel like you're no longer in Sicily and you're, step, and you're stepping into Tunisia. And these are some pictures from the uh, neighborhood. And I mean, if you've been anywhere in Northern Africa, you will recognize that, 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 that from a visual perspective, it is very reminiscent of, uh, of a North African Medina. And those structures there, they are from a, they are like from the ninth century. So they are 12 centuries old. 
So what happens in this, uh, in this situation is that Arabic is not confined to the home. So it's spo Arabic is spoken in the, in the Kasbah, and different varieties of Arabic are spoken in the Kasbah, which leads to uh, interesting processes of dialect leveling, which is not usually observed in uh, the diaspora, because usually speakers do not, uh, second generation speakers, do not use Arabic outside their, their house. So they, they learn Arabic from their parents, they use it as it is with their parents, and outside they will use the socially dominant language. In Mazara, Arabic is a white currency, so uh, uh, interdialect uh, develop uh, like leveling and accommodation and uh, um, uh, other interesting development occurred. Also, because uh, an interesting peculiarity of the another interesting peculiarity of the Tunisian community is that 95% of the Tunisians living in Mazara del Vallo come from two neighboring towns in the Tunisian coast, Mahdiya uh, and Shebba, whose dialects are really close and they are separated by uh, two clearly identifiable isoglosses. Among the others, of course, there are differences in, in the realization of vowels, but two of the most studied isoglosses in Arabic dialectology are there in the, in the dialects of Mahdiya and Shebba, and they, and they give us uh, a, a, a very easy way to study interdialect development. So the uh, ovular plus of qh is uh, realized as a, a voiceless realization in Mahdiya and a voiced realization in Shebba. Uh, and I forgot to mention that uh, speakers from Mahdiya make up 80% of the community, while speakers from Shebba make up the remaining 15% and the 5% that remains is made up of people from like old Tunisia, basically. So we have a majority and a minority community. Uh, this is the realization of the uh, ovular, ovular plosive. And then we have the set of the three interdentals, tha, tha, and vo, uh, which are preserved in Shebba and merged with the uh, corresponding plosives in, uh, in Mahdiya, which is strange because uh, Tunisian dialects are usually very conservative and they tend to preserve uh, the interdentals even in urban varieties, which is not so common in Northern Africa. So, um, given this very uh, uh, sketchy idea of how those dialects uh, differ, uh, my case study was taking 10 speakers from uh, Shebba, uh, first and second generations, plus one uh, speaker which I called uh, uh, old female speaker zero, because she is not from, uh, from Mazara del Vallo. She just moved to Mazara 10 days before I interviewed her. So she lost her husband and just joined uh, her uh, son in, in Mazara del Vallo. And I, had her, I, I knew her son and I had the opportunity to, to interview her before any kind of uh, leveling or, or um, uh, erosion happened. So, and then I interviewed 10 speakers, uh, five uh, first generation speakers and five second generation speakers. And I tried to understand what was going on there. Uh, so what we find is that uh, usually we don't expect this kind of variation in speaker in monolingual speakers that come from uh, that, that are not from a diasporic uh, context. So if we listen to this first audio file, uh, it's, so it's clear mute. I don't know how to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's that all we need. To. Check, uh, just, just check, yeah. Oh, okay. It's probably quite loud now. <laughs> so, I will just... <laughs> So he says, You find it, uh, it happens, but not, not so much, just for the people who are living in, in uh, Tunisia. So we have Qlil with a voiceless realization, and in the same sentence, from the same speaker, Tilgaham with a voice realization in the same sentence. And this is not just one uh, occurrence, it's basically, it's basically what happens with all speakers. You find it that it has not studied. 
تلقاهم with the voice realization قاري with the voiceless realization so this is not what we expect from monolingual speakers and in fact when I checked what happens with the all female speaker zero I realized that the voice realization is uh, occurs 93% of the times against a meager 7, 6% and in this 93% in this 6% or 7% I took into consideration also uh, items such as Quran, Taqalid, Alaqa which are uh, loan words from classical or modern standard Arabic and uh, for which a voiceless realization is expected. If we take away this, uh, this, this lexical items in which actually no variation occurs, what we have is basically 100%. So a monolingual speaker from uh, the, 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 the original town from Sheba will realize the voiced uh, uh, variant all the times, basically. What happens in, the, in our community is that from the first to the second generation, with a single exception here, all female speaker one, we have the, our most conservative speaker who realizes uh, the, the voice realization, the voice variant, 98% of the time. And at the other uh, extreme, we have young female speaker two, who is just 17, and who switched completely to the voiceless realization. So the variable is not stable across generations. It, there is uh, also probably some gender uh, variation here involved, but they didn't have enough speakers to, to take this into consideration as well. But it's clear that uh, first generation speakers are um, preserving to, to uh, different extents the voice realization, while second generation speakers are gradually switching to the voiceless realization, which is the Mahdiya, the socially, the, the, the majority uh, community uh, variant. If we go to the interdentals, uh, they are preserved by all female speaker uh, zero. And they are also preserved, this table is very difficult to read, but if you take this row into consideration, you will see that the interdentals are stable across generations. They are preserved by first and second generation speakers alike. And uh, so that, in brief, what we have taken into consideration two variables is that we have a, a marked variation which seems to increase in second generation speakers as far as the uh, ovular plosive is concerned, ق, which, uh, which becomes ق, while there is little or, or, or no variation with the interdentals. And the variables here are stable across generations. So my questions were, of course, what is happening, how and why? And after consulting with, uh, with uh, an am um and some more experienced social linguists, I resorted to the, uh, to the works of Trudgell, who describes a new dialect formation and, and the formation of colonial Englishes in uh, New Zealand and other, and other uh, parts of the globe. So, uh, these six stages can be summarized in three stages. So when uh, different varieties of the same language, or at least uh, mutually intelligible varieties of the same language, what we call dialects come into contact in a, in a, in a place, in a given place, three stages uh, occur that might uh, result in the formation of a new dialect. The first stage is, uh, is that of rudimentary leveling and interdialect development. It usually corresponds to the first generation. In the second generation, we have uh, apparent leveling and variability, intra individual and inter individual variability. While we have focusing and the creation, the formation of the actual new dialect in the third generation. So, uh, of course, he's speaking of something else, of the formation of colonial English, so of a, social, socially dominant, uh, uh, of a social dominant elite that moved to a faraway land with limited possibilities of contact with, uh, with the homeland. So, this paradigm is not readily uh, uh, available to be, to be applied to our situation, but it gives us an idea of what is happening. Uh, so in, in first generation speakers, we have a case of rudimentary leveling, clearly. In uh, Tunisian Arabic, k and g are present in basically all the varieties. So even varieties that are characterized by a voice realization have a set of lexical items that are realized with a voiceless realization and vice versa. Uh, varieties with a voiceless realization have uh, a set of lexical items that are realized with a the, with the voiced one. So there is here merger by transfer. Speakers are taking uh, lexical items from the what we call the k list. 
so the list of the lexical items realized with the voiceless uh, with the voiceless uh, variant and taking them and taking them into the list of uh, words realized with the voiced variant or in our case the opposite is happening so those speakers had a very long list of good items items that were realized with the voiced uh, variant and they're just moving them to the other list to the minor to the once minority list so we can and we will not enter into the details here we can speak of lockup speakers, Qaraya speakers, and Qbal speakers. I dubbed those speakers in this way, which means that we have speakers in which only very formal terms, such as lockup, uh, surname, are realized with the voiceless realization, which is a native-like uh, um, realization. We have Qaraya speakers, which means speakers who started using the voiceless realization also for terms that are um, that are like pertaining to more formal registers, which would not happen in 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 a, a, a native variety, and in, in triple in Libya we would have graya and not karaya, for instance. But these speakers are starting to use the voiceless variety, which is felt as standard-like, and it's the uh, 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 the, the variant of the uh, majority community in. Uh, terms pertaining to uh, formal registers. And finally, we have Qbal speakers. Qbal means before. So speakers, we started using the, the Q variant also for adverbs and prepositions and everyday terms, which means that the shift from G to Q is complete. Uh, in the second generation, what we have is apparent leveling. So uh, what we see is basically the same thing. Uh, speakers that uh, there is variation in speakers between k and g, but the leveling here is apparent because those speakers were born and raised in a situation in which the leveling had already been going on for decades, for two or three decades. So they were experiencing a, a, a linguistic reality in which the two variants uh, were present, and they tried to make sense of the linguistic variety uh, surrounding them in the best way that they could. The situation is as in very different uh, circumstances, as, as described as chaotic by Trajil for New Zealand, by Alwer for the dialect of Amman, the dialect of the second generations is usually the most chaotic because there is, the, there is the, this variation to, a, to an extent that it's hardly imaginable. For example, we have here, it's a very long excerpt and we'll probably just focus on the, on the items in bold. We have the same root Qra yakra or gra yagra to, to study and garra yagarri or qarra yagarri to, to teach. The same speaker in the same sentence keeps switching between g and q all the time. So we have tgarri, great, tgarri, ngarriha, and then takra, yakrao, takra, yakrao, takra, and then she switches again and the, the, the expert was actually very long. So we have this kind of intra individual variation in which speakers just keep. Uh, keep switching from one variant to the other without a clear pattern. And if we speak of inter-individual variation, we have two speakers here born and raised in the same neighborhood. Their houses are just a couple of meters uh, away from each other. The age difference is not that big, but we have here uh, preservation of the voice uh, ver uh, variant and 54% um, of the occurrences, while young female speaker two completely switched to the uh, to the voiceless variety, and the same happens with the interdentals. So we have interdentals clearly preserved by adult female speaker three, and uh, a partial sw a switch uh, for the th, and a total switch for the and young female speaker two. So we have this very chaotic situation, and of course the question here arises: Why the the, the plosive and not the interdentals. Why are why is uh, the, the the overall plosive marked by such a great variation, while the interdentals are preserved? And here, there are probably there's probably more than one factor, but one of the factors might be salience. So, and especially in the phase of rudimentary leveling, the the traits that are usually leveled out are uh, traits that are perceived by the speakers as distinguishing their dialect, while traits that are not perceived are usually uh, uh, left aside and they don't experience this kind of leveling. So after I realized what was going on, I started uh, at the end of the interviews uh, to avoid uh, um, influencing my speakers, to ask them what is the difference between your dialect when I was, speaker, when I was speaking to, di to the, the, the um, speakers from, from Sheba, what is the difference between your dialect and the dialect of Mahdiya? 
And all the, answer, all the answers I got was, were of this type. Manash. Let's see if we can listen to it. So there is, we have the difference, it's all the same, but there is only a little difference. There is speaking with ka and speaking with ga. And in Sheba, they also have a verb to mean speaking with the ka. So here he says there is only one thing they which means they speak with the with the ka. No mention of the interdentals were, was was ever uh, uh, made. Even though to my uh, like to the dialectologist, the lack of interdentals in Mahdiya is particularly evident. But since this is not perceived by speakers, they don't level it out. And the the lack of interdentals in Mahdiya is a very peculiar thing in the in the um, like in the context of Tunisian dialects, which may also help. So minority variants, if they are, they are unmarked, such as interdentals in Tunisian Arabic, have a higher chance to, to survive. So at this point, we have spoken about the, the first stage, the rudimentary leveling, the second stage, apparent leveling and uh, variation. The third uh, phase, uh, the third stage would be focusing in the birth of uh, an extraterritorial variety, a, a, a Tunisian dialect of Mazara. But will this dialect uh, uh, be born someday? I, I don't know. I don't think so because uh, there are different factors that, uh, to me, uh, hinder and the, the, the possibility of the formation of a new dialect. First of all, uh, all my speakers were spending at least one month a year in Tunisia, in their hometown, which counterbalances the language erosion and the leveling that they experience in uh, in Mazara del Ballo. Second, the uh, demographic balance of um, uh, Mazara del Ballo is altered in a way which uh, helps preserving Arabic but which hinders the, the formation of a new dialect because young uh, uh, adult speakers, bilingual speakers, leave Mazara del Ballo to go and, and look for uh, jobs in northern Italy or in, in northern Europe and those remain when they marry marry women uh, from Tunisia. They think that Tunisian women in Mazara are too westernized, so they go back to Tunisia and they marry women from Tunisia and they bring them to Mazara del Ballo, which means that new uh, uh, first generation speakers are constantly added to the small neighborhood, which keeps Arabic alive. But of course, they will not teach their children uh, a, second gener a second or a third generation uh, Tunisian variety, which has undergone uh, the, the, the kind of leveling that we just described. So we, I, I had a lot, I, I had a lot of, of speakers who were like third generation speakers from their father's side, but second generation speakers from their mother's side because their mother had just come from uh, Tunisia a couple of years before they were, they were born. And third, the process of, uh, of uh, erosion is, is slow, but it's happening. So at a certain point, I think that the community will switch to Italian. So, I know if, if this kind of uh, development will take place, if we will have a Tunisian dialect of Mazara. And I think that uh, research in the next 10 years is, is vital to, to analyze the trends of the community. So, okay. uh, going to uh, uh, language contact, of course, in this case, the, the range of phenomena are, is, is very wide. We have, of course, interference on the phonetic, morphological, syntactic, level, we have hybridization, we have code switching, and I will just uh, uh, speak of hybridization and then move to code switching. Apart from collecting interviews, I was monitoring the Facebook profiles of some of my speakers, and this is what, I, at a certain point, this is what happened in, in one of those profiles. One of the speakers says, Bella Fra, which means, which is, can be translated as cool bro, and the other uh, ends were saying, grazie, thanks, Hamdi Cedro. Hamdi Cedro is clearly the, the Arabic name uh, that ham with the uh, Sicilian diminutive morpheme, Edro. So it's little, little Ahmed or... 
And again, so this was not uh, an isolated occurrence. We had Kebedri, uh, which to be chosen. It's a mixture of Italian and Sicilian, how cool these guys are. These guys, I'm sorry for the typo. And the other one says, thanks, Safwan Ichedru. Again, with uh, Safwan, Arabic, and, and Edru, which is the, the diminutive, diminutive, uh, the Sicilian diminutive morpheme. So, uh, th th this kind of hybridization is happening is interesting in its own respect. So, it's, it's, now it's in a very peripheral area of the lexicon. So, nouns, I have not any, I've, I've not instances of like Chubzichedru for a little piece of bread or something like that. So, we cannot uh, today speak of morpheme induction. It's something that maybe goes in that direction, which is interesting because uh, uh, morpheme induction with the same morpheme already happened in Andalusi Arabic. Andalusi Arabic borrowed four or five morphemes from the Romance varieties spoken in the Iberian Peninsula, and one of them was El, coming from the Latin Ellum, which is etymologically cognate to the Sicilian Edru. It's basically the same morpheme. So, young Tunisians in Mazara del Valle today are replicating or are doing something which is very similar to what already happened in the in Al Andalus uh, uh, 12 centuries ago. So they are borrowing a, a morpheme that was already borrowed in, in another variety of uh, Arabic in contact with a variety of Romance uh, uh, centuries ago. And speaking of uh, Andalusi Arabic, something which is uh, interesting in my opinion is that Andalusi Arabic also borrowed the augmentative on uh, from uh, Romance. And it was, the, the morpheme was stable in Andalusi and was then uh, passed to uh, uh, Moroccan Arabic and from there it made its way to Tunisia. To the dialect of Sheba and Mazara and then was brought back to Italy by the immigrants. So this is a, this is a Facebook post addressed to my son by one of my informants saying Busa li Alessandro Sagrun Tahfun, the very cute and the very, uh, the very little and very cute Alessandro. So basically we have today two romance morphemes in the Arabic spoken in Mazara. One is, is a stable morpheme, is un, and is an augmentative, and was borrowed in, in uh, Al-Andalus, in the Iberian Peninsula, during the, in, in, like, during the Middle Ages. The other is not yet stable, it's Edo, it's maybe on the way of being fully acquired from the, by the, the, the uh, varieties of, of Tunisian Arabic spoken in Mazara. But we can have a glimpse, this is one of the reasons why it, it is important and interesting to, to analyze uh, diasporic communities, because we have a glimpse of what, what might have happened in, in like older times. Uh, I never heard any of my speakers saying Hamdi Jedu or Safwan Jedu. It's just in a playful mode on Facebook where language is more relaxed and where the, the, use, the, the use of polylanguaging and of like very creative and a very creative use of the language is the norm rather than the exception. And then another interesting phenomenon is of course code switching and I know there is a very uh, the literature on code switching in Arabic is, is impressive. Uh, I will just give you an idea of what happens across, for, across the generations. I use the matrix language framework so when two languages uh, are used in the same complementizer node or in the same phrase or sentence, the way you want. Uh, one provides uh, the grammatical morphemes and the other provide, provides the, the content, the, the, the lexical morpheme. So one provides grammar, the other provides words, like very briefly put. So in the first generations, the two languages, which are usually Arabic and Italian, are still clearly identifiable and so is the matrix language. The matrix language is, is Arabic and we have just switches limited to single lexical items. I don't love this area because this, this area was dangerous. This is a textbook example of code switching in which the switch is uh, at the node between the, the copula and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, adjective, the attributive adjective. If we go to second generations, first of all, we see that uh, often we don't have two but three codes. Italian, Arabic, and French. So, <laughs> this is uh, a perfectly bilingual uh, speaker, which is here using Arabic, Italian, so we have some uh, 
uh, samples of code switching where Italian is the dominant language, some others in which Arabic is the dominant language, while uh, French is not on the same level, it's, uh, it's relegated to the, to the role of extra phrasal tags. It's, to me, the use of French in this young, educated Tunisians uh, signals uh, sub-identity within the Tunisian identity. So it, it, it's, it's a clear indicator of uh, urban uh, uh, social identity uh, uh, through the use of, of French. And so we have three codes. We can have four uh, uh, with when, when those speakers use uh, English and they want to use it. And we have the languages coming in closer contact with switches that, are, uh, that happen in, in uh, uh, areas in which usually switching is not allowed or is more rarely allowed. For example, at the note between the noun and the attributive adjective. <laughs> So here the switch is between Luga, language, and straniera, foreign, and this kind of switch we have, uh, for example, Buman and Ruiter that uh, analyze uh, code switching in uh, Moroccan, uh, between Moroccan and Dutch in the Moroccan uh, diaspora, and they write that this kind of switch is rarely allowed in, in bilingual speakers. Well, here is, is very frequent, uh, and such a, and, and it is the same with the switch between the modal verb and the main verb. We have here. So she says, if I mean, I was asking her about the preservation of Arabic, and she said, uh, it depends on the parents if, I mean, if from childhood they make their children speak Arabic, or if they let them if they let them lose themselves. So the, the modal khalli khalli in Arabic requires a verb in the prefixal conjugation, an imperfective after it, and this verb is provided by Italian, and, but is conjugated according to, in accordance with the syntax of Arabic, not of Italian, because in Italian that would require a verb in the infinitive. But at a certain point, the same speaker switches to a mixed matrix language expression Sing. So she says, uh, apart from that, uh, uh, my parents, this can also be a good thing that they let me integrate with the Italians. In this case, the modal verb is in Arabic, conjugated in Arabic, and the verb integrarmi is in the Italian infinitive, while the Arabic modal requires a verb in the prefixal conjugation. So we don't know which, we, we cannot uh, identify here the matrix language with Arabic nor with Italian because both the languages are providing grammar at the same time in this, uh, in this node, in this uh, phrase. So we have a mixed matrix language in, in uh, uh, speakers that are perfectly bilingual. And the same happens, for example, here. <laughs> So I was asking him whether it is important to know Arabic and say Mohim. I asked Alish why, and he said Al Khatri Arbi Unajim Naref Akter Wahed Mia Lingua. I can know that's not very native like uh, Mia Lingua, which is Italian, my language. But uh, Italian here requires the definite article, the my language, which is of course not allowed in English, and it is not allowed in Arabic. And the absence of the definite article here in a, a speaker that is fully bilingual as an eight-year-old child is clearly motivated, as a third-generation speaker, is clearly motivated by the fact that here uh, the position of the uh, possessive is clearly uh, uh, due to Italian because Arabic would have lingua mia with the uh, possessive postponed to the, to, the, to the noun. But the absence of the definite article is dictated by the, the, the syntax of Arabic. So once again, we have a mixed metrics language here because, and, and I think and in this case, the sentence is not well formed in, in either of the two languages. So we have an attempt at a mixed metric language, while here the, the, the sentence and the, the, the phrase was respecting the grammars of both the languages at the same time. So if you listen again. <laughs> He says Akhtar Wad, so he's not pronouncing the uh, pharyngeal H. It doesn't say Akhtar Wahid. 
So third generation speakers are starting uh, uh, experiencing to experience uh, a stronger uh, language erosion with the loss of market phonemes. In this case, I don't, I don't think it is interference, phonetic interference from Italian. We don't need, we, we should have to motivate this kind of interference. What I think is that we have uh, weakened monitoring, so the chain of uh, transmission of the language is not broken, but it's weakened. So uh, some developmental forms, forms that are typical of the first stages of language acquisition uh, and that appear and then disappear in young monolingual speakers are here allowed to spread and to survive into the, the speech of uh, older, older speakers. Uh, so that, for instance, uh, we have, this is the etymological form, in Tunisian Arabic, he found bees and boy. And in Mazarat al-Ballo, we now have stably uh, in second generation speakers the forms qi instead of al qi, hal instead of nhal, and lid with a, with, a, with a compensatory lidda sometimes instead of ulid. So in Maghrebi Arabic, uh, no short vowels are allowed in open and stressed syllable. So that from nahal we have nhal, from walad we have ulid. Uh, and our speakers are taking this to the next level, uh, uh, deleting the first consonant. And so we have these forms that are also sometimes find, uh, found in pigeons and creoles in dying languages. There is a wide literature on that. Uh, so situations in which the social control on the language is weakened uh, are often marked by the spread and survival of uh, forms that are typically acquired during the first stages of language acquisition by speakers and then lost when the social environment uh, uh, check them and, 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 and like correct the, the children and then acquire the, the, um, uh, the correct forms. Do I have time? You have plenty of time, yeah. Okay, so third, and this is like way to cool down. Uh, I was, uh, while I was doing this research, apart from the strictly linguistic um, analysis, I was also paying attention to the, the way in which uh, language was, was used to express the, the identity of those, uh, of, of especially the second generations. And of course, when we think of second generation in Arabic speaking diasporic community, we think of a mixture and of a balance between the Arabic Tunisian identity and the Italian identity. But what I found is that the sum is always greater than the parts and that we find aspects uh, which are typical of youth culture that we wouldn't expect and that we don't expect until, until we see them. So, of course, uh, uh, youth culture is, is uh, uh, often characterized, and it's the same here, by uh, processes of inclusion and exclusion. So inclusion of members of the group and exclusion of all the ones who don't belong to the group. And uh, here, uh, people who are not part of the group are, uh, at the same time, Italians living in Mazara. Uh, with whom maybe my speakers had good relationships, but they were not clearly part of their group, but also older Tunisian speakers in Mazara, which were from a different culture and which didn't, uh, and who didn't take part in this, in this uh, uh, polyphonic identity. So for example, this is one of the uh, uh, typical ways in which this inclusion and exclusion process is, is expressed. This is a Facebook post in which uh, one of my speakers, uh, the one who writes Tutto bene zia, uh, I'm fine auntie, uh, uh, posted a picture uh, in which he was expressing sad feelings. But it was a cool picture. So the, the aunt says, oh, writes, Wene Klebes, how are you? And, and it says, Tutto bene zia, switch into Italian. She, she writes back, Va bene nipote, great nephew. And he says, Manki zia, I miss you. At this point, one of his friends like, interrupts this exchange with this sentence saying, Bella jet frere, in which he managed to uh, use three languages in a sentence which is composed by three words. So that Bella is clearly Italian, cool, and, and jet is, is, is uh, it came, and frere, of course, it's, it's French. So what he wants to say is, the, the, it's a venuta, be, a venuta bella, it's a, an Italian expression to say the picture came out good. I don't know what is the idiomatic expression in English. But it says that translating it in a mixture of Italian, uh, Arabic, and French, and of course, uh, the Italians will not understand what that means, but I think that also this is a way to exclude the older end from the, from the conversation. 
So, and this is achieved by using at the same time in the process of polylanguaging Italian, Sicilian, Arabic, and French, sometimes English. And, and I apologize for the uh, uh, language here. So uh, we have a, a mixture of Sicilian dialect, of elements of uh, very weird in this context, gangster culture, uh, and of African-American culture from the US, and also this uh, feeling of not, fitting, of not fitting in with the community that is felt by, I think, old youth groups is here amplified by the fact that those speakers are not, some, some of them uh, are not Italians, they, are not, they have no Italian citizenship. Uh, anyway, they are perceived as the other in the context of Mazar del Valle, they live in the Kasbah. And so they claim for them this, this, other, this otherness uh, using the word clandestino, which is, of course, in Italian, illegal. So we have here the use of bro, which is like, we, we wouldn't think that Tunisian immigrants in southern, in a Sicilian small town would use, would resort to this. But we have buongiorno ragazzi, morning guys, and then giorno bro, morning bro. And the third one says morning illegals, triggering the very, uh, uh, like, I don't know how to call that, but like the third speaker insults him. And, but he replies saying, I got that from you, you illegal. So there is this strong claiming of this otherness that is, that is like interjected by, by our speakers to the point that they uh, painted one of the walls uh, of the Kasbah with this very unusual ghetto uh, uh, thing and they were taking pictures posing as, as like uh, the inhabitants of a, real, of a real ghetto and the Kasbah was for some time, a sort of a ghetto. It was really avoided by the Italians. The first time that I went to Mazzara del Vallo to do research, and I part my car, I was with my wife, uh, I asked, I didn't know where the Kasbah were, I was, and I asked them, I'm sorry, how can I get to the, to the Kasbah? And, said, and the, the Italians told me, you don't want to be there, you don't want to go there. And if you go there, don't go to Via Bagno, which was the place in which I conducted, like, I think, 40 of my 65 interviews, with, because it was the, 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 the center of the, of the Kasbah. And uh, I think that 50 meters from the mosque, they, they, they wrote ghetto on, uh, it is one of the roads in which, uh, uh, through which you enter the Kasbah. So they, they made it their own by painting this, this thing. And this uh, gangster culture is not of course just borrowed and important as it is, it's given a Sicilian twist. And of course from gangster to mafia, the, the, the step is, is very brief. So the, 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 the speaker here writes, Wasso, wasso, jmat, mafioso, so make room for the mafia guys. And again, triggering some other very interesting responses that I left uh, out of this, <laughs> of this slide. So this, is, I think, is another, it's not strictly, it's, it's, it's linguistics, but uh, it's, it's something which is not uh, exactly my field, but I think it's uh, equally interesting. Uh, so that research in the next 10 years will be, uh, should be conducted in Mazzara del Vallo, this is in a, a view of Mazzara del Vallo, uh, should be conducted both on the uh, strictly linguistic level to see how the third generation evolves, if Arabic uh, keeps being preserved with uh, which kind of Arabic, if this variety of, if this Mazzara uh, variety of uh, Tunisian Arabic uh, rises or not, and, and, but also from the point of view of identity and how the second and third generation uh, Tunisians manage to shape their identity uh, within, within a small uh, country, within a small village that is at the, in, in a very peripheral area of Western Europe, but even of Italy, if you think of it. It's the most southern part of Italy, the most eastern part, the most uh, western part of Sicily. It's, it's somewhere in between uh, Sicily and, and Tunisia. So I will, uh, this place is only one hour from where I live, so I will keep doing research uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, and, and, and I hope I will be, I will have some updates like after a couple of years, after I, I'm able to interview more third generation speakers. And these are some of my sources, which I will uh, send you if, you if you're interested. And I thank you for your attention. Another interesting place. Yeah, and um, 
uh, they do the same the same things. So when you said that they're doing um, what did you call it? Three codes in one mm -hmm. sentence. Um, yeah. So I grew up like that as well. So you're a native speaker of um, the Arabic, right? Second, second language speaker because I was born and grown up here. Okay. But I, I I say sentences which have three languages in them. With um, with this old variety of Albanian. Yeah. So like you say like. Uh, I'm studying at the University of London, for example. Yeah, I'm studying the University of London. Yeah, and that is another area where, in yeah. which, uh, which is understated and is absolutely for. for uh, you probably don't know about it in Sicily, in the heart of Sicily, there is a, t a, a town which is called Piana de Albanesi, Bali of the Albanians, in which uh, an Arabish community uh, um, like sought mm. refuge uh, when the Ottomans conquered, uh, like their country basically and they've been there for centuries now and they're still speaking Arabic after I think five centuries now five, five centuries and and I, once again we have no status concerning this this uh, the way in which uh, this uh, variety of Albanian is preserved in, in Sicily so yeah come come to Sicily and, and help us doing research when you said about the diminutives I mm -hmm. thought that's really interesting because we we have exactly the same thing as well we, like um, Words like flower, lula, everyone knows this word. Mm -hmm. But li little flowers, lulicel. Ah, lu and uh, uh, lulicel. Lulicel. So cel is like a Sicilian diminutive with before it changed from yeah. Lula but that, that's yeah, but it's not actually the the way in which Sicilian evolved because the the l from Latin evolved into edu or edru in, in Sicilian. So this is an older version of the diminutive that you're preserving, which is even more interesting. Why is it that, why is it that Sicilian diminutives are so strong? Uh, no, this is just a phonetic, no, this is uh, the, the, the L, the Latin uh, double L just evolved into, into a, a, a plosive in, in Sicilian. So we have the. So if you say Stella in Sicilian we have if you say cavallo, we have cavallo, bella is bedra, and so this is. But the, what you're preserving is an older stage of romance, which I don't even know if was borrowed in Sicily or somewhere else, and then brought to Sicily, which is fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know how relevant it is, but. I seem to recall that um, uh, there is an influence of Arabic um, on the Sicilian um, uh, version of Italian or, as well. Um, I think a Pironello, the well-known Italian Sicilian writer, wrote his PhD at the University of Berlin on the subject of the uh, influence of Arabic on uh, the Sicilian, very Sicilian dialect. So does that in any way? Oh yeah, we, yeah, uh, I used, I didn't know about uh, Pirandello PhD. At this point I will, I will try to, to get a copy of the dissertation. We have a couple of studies and I used one of them, which is a more recent uh, study on, on the influence of Arabic on Sicilian, which is a very strong influence. Uh, so of course there is uh, lexical uh, borrowing from, from Arabic into Sicilian. But there is also uh, grammatical influence. So we have structures in Sicilian that are uh, not attested in any other uh, Romance variety in southern Italy because they're clearly uh, calc from, uh, from, from the Arabic, from, from Tunisian or Libyan or Libyan Arabic. And sometimes it was interesting to see how influence of Arabic on Sicilian and the other way around, the influence on, of Sicilian on Arabic gave rise to similar, to similar uh, results. I left this, this uh, slide uh, out of this presentation because it involved a very deep knowledge of the way Italian and Sicilian works, but we have, for example, the expression, uh, you go buy this thing, which is, uh, I think it's grammatical in English. It's not grammatical in Italian. I cannot say, vai, compra, questa cosa. But if you speak Sicilian, va, catta, questa cosa, where you go, you buy this thing is grammatical. This is not, uh, this was already grammatical in Latin, was something that was lost from Latin to Italian and was preserved by Sicilian, but M. Shishri al Hajahadi in Arabic, it's, it's, it's even more common than, in, than it was in Latin. So this, uh, this, this uh, structure grammaticalized in Sicilian and it's omnipervasive in Sicilian. 
So even though it was there in Latin, so we don't have to uh, postulate a, a direct influence of Arabic, the influence of Arabic is, is clear there because the, the, the way in which Sicilian, uh, the Sicilian dialect uses this, um, this constructed structure differs from the way that, uh, in which all the other southern varieties of Italian uh, use them. And Tunisian speakers, when they arrive, they have this structure in their dialect. They hear it in the Sicilian dialect, and of course they think that it is grammatical in Italian. So they borrow it, and so you, you, you will find this structure in their L2 Italians, in the, the L2 Italian, because they have it in their dialect, they hear it in Sicilian dialect, and they think it's, it's okay to do it in, uh, in Italian. So there, there, there was an, uh, an interference from Arabic on Sicilian, and now the way back from Sicilian to, to L2 speakers of Italian coming from Tunisia, which is very complicated, but interesting. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Um, sorry, my knowledge of code switching is a bit basic, so forgive the basic question, but there is a kind of fundamental rule of code switching so that you shouldn't be able to change grammatical construction in the switch. So the example you gave with C pair Bono, I think, that yeah. should have been the infinitive into pair dash C or whatever you'd expect. Yeah. yeah. So it should be Yechalium per dash C, but in. So your question was. So I'm just wondering. Firstly, am I right in thinking that that does kind of break some sort of major expectation of code switching? And secondly, why do you feel that is? Is it, is it an indication of, of a particularly strong change? I mean, what does it what No, does so it tell uh, you? Uh, this is, we have these two sentences. It, it is the same verb. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then yeah. Yeah. So in the first uh, sentence, what I think uh, is the grammar is clearly Arabic. Yeah. So she's using, she's importing the grammar of Arabic onto Italian. Yeah. Which uh, means that, to me, that is not an indicator of a, a, any great change. To me, what is, uh, what is more interesting is this case, mm -hmm. in which, uh, first of all, the switch between uh, modal and the, the, the verb is not, always, is not always allowed. So I was studying, um, I was studying some uh, descriptions of code switching in other uh, um, diasporic communities, Arabic uh, diasporic communities, and something like that uh, rarely uh, was rarely found in those communities. When it happens, what I expect is this, actually. Okay. It's this because uh, this in this case the matrix language is clearly Arabic, and unless the the opposite is, is proved we would expect that we have only one matrix language. When we get to this point, we need to recognize that we have two matrix languages, and this to me is uh, an indicator that the, the, the two languages are coming in, in real close contact, because the, in this case, the, the young female speaker 12, this is the most perfectly bilingual speaker that I was able to, to interview, and she would do that all the time, uh, code switching, but respecting at the same time the grammars of the, uh, of the two languages, which is not the case here. This speaker is younger, and as, as code switching, the code switching here, is, uh, the switch here is, also has a mixed matrix, a matrix language, but it fails to, uh, uh, to respect the, 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 the grammaticality uh, requirements of Italian, of course, but also of Arabic, because the, I would have expected either la mia lingua or lingua mia because the uh, Italian possessives under certain circumstances can be used uh, after, after the, to emphasize after uh, the, the noun. In this case, it, it tries and, and, and it feels, and, it, and it, this is typical of uh, for also first generation speakers who have lived the entire life basic, uh, basically in Mazara or 20 or 30 years in Mazara and who uh, try to produce uh, this kind of sentences but with uh, results that are not always grammatical in neither uh, of the language. Are Sicilian or Italian verbs ever incorporated into Arabic structure? Like, you know how Maltese does that? And then my language does it too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we have... So uh, I have a couple. So in the integration uh, of verbs, we have different ways of integrating verbs. Uh, one is root extraction. So, for example, from the Italian spesa, so I'll go buy grocery. We have the verb sabbis, which in Libyan is to smoke. Yes. 
So when I when I uh, heard people saying Nimshin Sabbas, and uh, so there was, I was interviewing a woman and said, "Khalas uh, tawa Nimshin Sabbas." To me, it was very strange because she was telling me, "Now, like, now it's enough. I have to go smoke." And I said, "This, this is very weird." But then they explained to me that it was I am going to, to buy a grocery, but we also have uh, samples that are uh, similar to Maltese. So I have one. Uh, my speakers speaking of the uh, financial crisis that hit uh, Mazzara uh, del Ballo, saying "Labed people soffri," from the Italian "soffrire," which is conjugated with a prefix, a conjugation in, t in, in, in Tunisian "Labed soffri," or "Huwa uh, parkeji," from "parkeggiare" to park, which is just given uh, an Arabic prefix and used in the language as it is. Uh, th th there's more research is needed here because when you, uh, you sometimes you hear the things and then you ask for more and of course when you ask they're never able to recollect this this uh, samples so you need endless hours of conversation because you never know when something uh, like that might uh, pop up I, I collect some of them but I, I, I suppose there is more and more I, I also have uh, not the verb but from the Italian staccare which means to unplug I have mistaki, which means staccato, which is a participle uh, in the mufa'al form from uh, stacca i stacchi. So yeah, we have, they have those, and I guess that having, spending more time with them uh, than a single summer will, might yield some very interesting results. Just come, it's your place. <laughs> Would um, any of the speakers um, be able to speak al fusha So this is uh, there. I learned a lesson from uh, trying to answer this question because a part of my um, uh, research was trying to realize how the diglossic situation of Arabic is important into a diasporic uh, community. So of course, I tried to do that in a very uh, indirect way. So I had uh, an excerpt from Al Jazeera, and it was one of their taqrir uh, of their say taqrir in English no, the, the report. report, the initial report from uh, uh, from a program, and I had them listen to the report and then talk about it. But after two or three um, uh, interviews, they realized, or they they perceived that as a sort of uh, an accent in fusha, which made them even more uncomfortable because I was not a native speaker. So they, and of course, uh, first generation speakers left Tunisia in the 60s and 70s, and their knowledge of Fusha was not so uh, high. Second generation speakers, even those who were, who attended the, the Tunisian school, which is only five years, they, all, they only had the elementary school. Of course, five years of Fusha and then switching to the Italian school means that by, in, in two or three years, you forgot all the Fusha, you have, uh, 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 assuming that you spoke Fusha in the first place. So when I started interviewing them, they, they didn't uh, take it so well, so I left this part of the, because it, it, it was uh, jeopardizing the rest of the interview. So first I tried to do that at the end of the interview, but then I realized that it was making my speakers uncomfortable, and I just, so they were, what they were saying said, uh, was this, um, this subject uh, makes me uncomfortable, not the language, the subject, even though it was a very uh, neutral subject, and, and they were just, uh, ready to move. Uh, sometimes I, I try to do it some other way by switching the conversation to uh, religious, to religion or uh, political. Uh, pol politics was not uh, an easy topic in uh, Mazara because they felt that the Tunisian government was watching them there. It's a very weird situation because when I arrived there, this, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neighborhood, so you think that you understand what is going on. There are three uh, coffee houses there. And I was regularly going there, doing my interviews there, and then one of my, both one of my speakers and one of my Italian sources there told me these are not uh, privately owned coffee houses. The 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 the, the gahwaji there, the, the 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 owner is paid by the government. It's it's a it's a public employee basically. So what was going on there was not uh, even the conversations that were going on there was not natural. Uh, so. Uh, even when speaking of religion, they didn't use uh, fusha. And when I asked them about fusha, fusha uh, constantly ranked lower than Tunisian Arabic in terms of uh, 
language attitude and appreciation. So they, they, they told me I prefer, my native language is Tunisian and I prefer speaking in Tunisian, which was strange to me because usually even uh, uh, speakers who don't speak Fusha very well will tell you that Fusha is their native language. While in this case they said, and um, a, a fellow linguist who worked on the Italian of uh, the, the Tunisians of Mazar del Vallo doing uh, interviews in Italian and from another perspective came to the same result. Italian and Tunisian Arabic ranked higher, ranked highest in terms of, uh, of what the speakers, how the speakers perceive those languages and uh, Sicilian dialect and uh, Fusha was not so appreciated. Fusha mainly because I said uh, we don't need it here and it's complicated and young speakers had uh, bad associations of Fusha with uh, the Tunisian school of Mazar al Vallo. <laughs> so they said, sometimes when I ask them about the, the, the Fusha, they say, no, uh, they will hit you on your hands. Uh, which is, of course, but they were eight or nine year old speakers and had this perception of the way in which Fusha is, is taught uh, in a very traditional environment. Uh, so it's, I don't think that Fusha, it's part of the repertoire. Of course, they, they are able to follow uh, the news or cartoons in, uh, in Fusha, but of course, active competence, if it was there in the first place, is lost. I, 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 have, a, I have a question which yes. you've actually kind of comprehensively answered, I think, uh, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Um, you know, when, more towards the beginning, you, you, you presented this interesting discrepancy between the the variable and the intendentals, and so from uh, you know the Shevda dialect has has g and uh, intendentals, yeah, uh, and the Mahdiya dialect has pa and stops. Now of course uh, Fosha has pa and intendentals. So I, I was wondering whether there was any kind of influence from the standard pushing the um, Shevda people to change to pop, but nevertheless to retain the intendentals. But this was no, no. This was a question that, and I was, uh, I, I talked with, and I'm about that, and she tell, and she told me, no, Luca, Fus has never an influence <laughs> on the way on variation in the dialect. So I said, okay. Uh, I think that uh, it's. I don't know whether this Fus ha or the idea of uh, um, a prestige Tunisian urban variety that is pushing them because what I thought is that, uh, what, I, what I found is that uh, speakers from uh, Sheba they switch to Ko and they retain their interdentals and I found that educated speakers, young educated speakers from Mahdiya started uh, showing interdentals. So even though they are the majority community in Mazar, so they, they don't adapt to the other variables, to the other variants uh, uh, with, uh, in terms of, of also vowels and, and, and diphthongs I left uh, out of this presentation, but they tend to realize interdentals, not regularly, but they, they, uh, but they, they, sh they show in their, uh, they're featured in their dialects. So I actually, I don't know whether this is, because I, when I started doing this, I also used the diphthongs because I thought, is this accommodation to the dialect of uh, Tunis? Is there any influence from standard? And since both uh, Mahdi and Shebba as uh, A and O as the realization of the etymological diphthongs, while the standard as I and O and Tunis as E and U, I thought I can use the, the diphthongs to realize uh, what it is that they are accommodating to. And they are preserving their diphthongs A and O. So I, I said, so maybe it's not, it's not, uh, the, it's not Fusha, but I had this conversation with Anna when she told me, look, I'll leave that out of, of your paper because we don't have a Fusha. <laughs> and even when, and the, no, but the way she put it is, even when we claim influence from uh, Fusha, it's not actually Fusha. Is like she wrote in her paper. It's uh, one of the papers of her papers. It's, it's the fact that those are highly educated speakers. So they, 
education is a very is a social linguistic variable in the sense that people are acquainted to other varieties of Arabic, and it's not fusha in itself that is that is influencing their variety. And I mean, I'm not that sure about this can be applied here. Yeah. Um, um, you were presenting the ship by the Mahdiya communities, but I'm sure this second generation, some of the marriages might be a mix. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, well, the thing did is, you record such speakers? Or uh, I have uh, speakers. So the, the mixed marriages are not uh, so are not so many. Not because they don't men there is something which prevents marriages from people from Shabba and Mahdiya within the community but because speakers from Mahdiya and from Shabba try to go back to their uh, villages and get their wives from there and sadly what happens is that also the situation is quite sad frankly because uh, uh, young adult uh, speaker, male speakers go back to Tunisia and they source a wife in Tunisia in their hometown and the girls who are in uh, Mazar al-Bal, of course, they, they have to marry. And they also go back to Tunisia. And the, the question is, if they are too westernized for a Tunisian living in Mazar, wouldn't they be too westernized for a Tunisian uh, living in Tunisia? But at this point, the answer is, they are grown-ups, they are uh, more than 18 year old, they have Italian citizenship. So even if they are westernized, they have a citizenship, Italian citizenship, so they can help. So we don't have a lot of, of, of uh, mixed marriages because of this, because everyone tend to go back and, and, and marry at home. But we have uh, other communities. I have uh, speakers from Tabarta, and they also have good, and their patterns, it's very similar to the pattern that I experienced in Shemba. So switch to uh, one, of, uh, one of my speakers without showing a, a very high mental linguistic uh, competence, uh, without being asked, said, said that the Mahdiya variety is the winning variety here. And you see, I'm from Tabarka, I should, I should be speaking with Ga, but I speak, you with, I speak using the Ka because I'm, I'm always with, with people from Mahdiya. So this is the, it is clear to me that the community is accommodating to the Mahdiya variety. Of course, not to, we don't accommodate to a variety. And taking into consideration all the variants, for the, as far as the Ovalar is concerned, the Mahdiya variety is being accommodated to by, other, by members of other communi of mi minority communities. Do they know Sicilian, and especially young people? So, uh, yeah. Uh, it was interesting to me because they didn't speak Sicilian to me, even though I'm, not, I'm a native uh, speaker of Sicilian. I mean, I have former students of mine. I started speaking Italian when I was at college. I'm from a small rural village and my place you speak Sicilian. You, you don't speak Italian uh, on the phone. If, if they call me and answer using uh, Italian, my mother will understand that there, there are people around me and I cannot talk. They will say, I'll call you later. So even though sometimes I was using Sicilian to them, they answered in Italian. And they said that Sicilian is for, uh, for ignorant people, it shows lack of education and of, of cultural backwardness. So uh, the way Sicilian was then, uh, um, was then used in very informal settings such as uh, Facebook and, and in these youth groups that I was not able to uh, study in detail, if not through Facebook and, uh, and their indirect ways, because if, if I was there, they were switching to Italian. But uh, uh, judging from the way in which they use uh, uh, Sicilian on Facebook and on social media, I, they, they, they know uh, Sicilian, not native-like. I, I recorded some very uh, hilarious incident uh, in the language that, that required very deep knowledge of Italian because they were using a word uh, assuming that it meant uh, don't uh, like don't care, don't, don't pay attention to those people, but he ended up uh, using an F word. Uh, and the other uh, speaker was not even aware because he, he, he took it as a compliment and he, and he, yeah. kept, and he kept answering in this uh, surreal conversation. <laughs>
Can I ask you why, why do you call Sicilian a dialect? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, linguistically speaking, it's not a dialect of Italian. It's, it's a yeah, it's a language, and it's a dialect of it's a Romance dialect. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, it's, it's not a dialect in the way in which perceived dialects of, of English. Yeah. It's clearly a, a variety of Romance uh, that was spoken in, uh, in Sicily. It's, it's, it pre-exists Italian, of course. On social media, seems to be different to the way they use in real life. Could you comment on that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether this is different or it is different from the way in which they use language when grow when grown ups are with them. Because when I was doing interviews and recording, even in uh, I was uh, in a in a school with lots of, of young Tunisians around, they were speaking to each other and they were using Italian. And when I asked them explicitly, do you use Sicilian? They said, no, I don't, I don't like. And during the questionnaire, one of the uh, questions was, uh, do you use Italian? Do you use Sicilian? What, uh, as an Italian, what is your language? When do you use Sicilian? When do you use Italian? And the only context in which they allowed the use of Sicilian was uh, to joke, or when I'm really angry, or when I want to tease one of my uh, classmates. So I didn't expect. Uh, this kind of, of usage of Sicilian on the social media. But then consulting with one of my mentors told me, why don't you go and, and check their social media? Because sometimes uh, things that, and this is not just on the, this is not just something that happens for um, the Tunisians. This is, it, it, the, 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 this, this uh, professor of mine who told me uh, to do that is a professor of Italian linguistics at the University of Palermo. And he said, we have studies concerning young Italians who are now uh, semi-speakers in terms of Sicilian. They don't use it in, in uh, everyday life, but they, uh, in a very creative way, they use, they recover and they use Sicilian in, uh, on social media. And it's a way in which the dialect is, is preserved, even though it's not, it's not a, a living dialect anymore. So what they're doing uh, in this case is not very different from what young Italians, uh, monolingual Italians are doing, or Sicilians are doing with Italian and Sicilian. As a footnote, uh, I think uh, the detective stories of Camilleri, oh. uh, <laughs> uh, Commissario Montalban, was yeah. given Sicilian. <laughs> so it was, uh, <laughs> Montalban was, uh, Camilleri is actually, uh, the, is, 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 I know he's not Sicilian. No, no, he's Sicilian. Oh, he and is, it was, he lives uh, in Rome. He lives in Rome and is from Porto and Pedro, which is 10 and miles from where, from where I live. In the novels, so there's a lot of Sicilian. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it, that's a very literary Sicilian. Sometimes, and uh, his, his village is, like I said, 10 miles yeah, from yeah. my village, so uh, we know him personally. Right. And sometimes when I read uh, his, his novels, I say, this is not what we say. <laughs> it's, it's a very, but there is a tradition of literary Sicilian, okay. which is used by, uh, so we have, in Sicilian, we have this literary language used by, there is a, there is a, a poetry in Sicilian, and, and it predates Italian poetry. So there's always been, there's been a, a, a tradition of literary Sicilian that is uh, in Pirandello and also in, uh, in Camilleri. And there is now in this new uh, trend of using Sicilian on uh, social media, but also in uh, music, there are now some rappers and, and hip hop singers in Sicilian who are using the real Sicilian, okay. the, the street language, which is something that has never actually happened. So they're doing it now. I think it's a, it's a response to the global, it's the sort of globalization. They, they, they are borrowing uh, music styles from the US, from, from Europe, and, and, and uh, doing that in their Sicilian dialect. But this is also new because it's the first time uh, in which the real dialect is find, finds its way in a, in a form of art. It's just music, because literature has always been the literary dialect. You think Gomorrah has something to do with the uh, ghetto gangster stuff? The, uh, the that well, no, no, this has been, this predates, uh, before it's before, it's before Gomorra. Uh, Gomorra is a Italian TV show focusing on, on the mafia in, uh, in Naples. And uh, it's a completely different strand, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Gomorra is an entirely different strand. It uh, isn't the mafia at all. Uh, no, it's, no, this is Gomorra. 
It's not Camorra. Oh, it's Kabuki. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it plays and with the, the word. Naples, it's got nothing to do with the system. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, the, the ghetto, I think, uh, comes from, it, it's definitely something born from uh, African-American culture because they were also, there is another uh, place in which they, they wrote Casbah Crew on the, on the walls. So they're in some way uh, importing and borrowing this silence from, from a culture which I didn't think could have an influence on Maybe the way. Uh, no, they don't, they don't listen. They, no, this is a, a major area of weakness. They admit that they don't understand Moroccan. So the modal intelligibility of Arabic dialects and a diasporic uh, context such as, such as Mazad al-Ballo is not, is not the same as in the, as in the Arabic speaking world. There are a couple of Moroccans in, in town and they adjust to Tunisian because the, their Moroccan dialect is not readily uh, understood by young Tunisians. Okay, I think unfortunately time has run out. Um, thank you so much once again thank you. for a wonderful talk.